Thank you, Father. Uh, um, so, Father mentioned uh, that I have his brother as pastor. My, my wife and our five kids belong to St. Lambert's in Sioux Falls, and Father John Rutten is, is indeed our pastor. Uh, for those of you who are at Mass, you may have heard Father speaking about um, the two Jameses who were apostles. There's actually three Jameses. James was a common name. But uh, Father mentioned how there's uh, James the Greater and James the Lesser. Uh, the same thing is true in our diocese with our priest whose last name is Rutten. <laughs> There's Father Rutten the Greater and Father Rutten the Lesser. I'll let you guys decide who's got who. Uh, actually, they, they did, Father, Father Paul and Father John went on um, uh, the, pilgrim, the March for Life pilgrimage a few years ago and somebody made them both signs. Uh, and Father Paul got to be Father Rutten the Greater because he's older, so it's, that makes sense. Um, the other thing before I, I, we get into tonight's topic, how many of you were here uh, last month? Just curious, how many of you heard Deacon Ralph Poyo speak? Okay, a few of you. So, Deacon Ralph Poyo uh, was here in, in Watertown at Immaculate Conception on that Sunday, the day before uh, he had been at an event that we uh, put on for all of the diocese in Sioux Falls. Um, and I came up with a term because of Deacon Ralph's style. Um, he, I think going Poyo means when you wander. So, because you, a lot of you are way back here, far, far away, I might wander. We'll see. I don't know. This is getting away from my notes. I'm feeling <laughs> nervous doing this. But uh, we'll see how that goes. I don't like to back to people, though, either. So we'll see what happens. But the topic for tonight, to get a little bit more serious, is about recognizing God in the everyday ordinary. Recognizing God in the everyday ordinary. So we're going to be talking about how to, how to see God in our daily lives. How to see God in our daily lives, how to see Him in the course of the ordinary events that fill our day, and the, fam I was going to say the ordinary people, but they're not ordinary. The familiar people in our daily lives. And really, again, I, I was struck um, by something the Father said during his homily, uh, Father Paul, during his homily tonight, uh, Mass before we, we ate. Uh, something about from the Gospels. There's this line in, in the Gospel where Philip says to Jesus, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Um, and, and, and Father Paul talked about how, well, how much more did Philip need? I mean, all the miracles, everything that Jesus had done, how much more does he need than what he's already done? And yet, I think there's something that really connects with our theme tonight in what Philip said. Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. The proposal for the, this theme, uh, the, the proposal behind this theme for tonight, is that every one of us desires to find God in our daily life. We want to see... To, to, so recognizing God in the everyday ordinary. We want that. Jesus, show us the Father. Jesus, show us yourself. That we, that we want to see God in the everyday, ordinary parts of our lives. The people who we interact with on a regular basis. The events of our regular day. We want to see, show us the Father and that will be enough. Uh, and so we're going to spend um, uh, most of the evening... Um, over the next four hours, talking about <laughs> what? I, it's only an hour and a half to Sioux Falls. If I'm home by midnight, my wife's putting the kids down. It doesn't. Um, the next whatever half hour or so, uh, looking at how we see. But I want to begin by addressing the difficulty that I faced, maybe that you face have faced in the past, maybe still face today. Even though we might desire to see God in the ordinary, in the everyday, we struggle with seeing Him in the ordinary and everyday. Uh, and I think there are several reasons why that is, but there are two things in particular that I just want to touch on by way of introduction. 
Uh, I, I, I'm convinced that for most of us, the vast majority of us, at some point in our lives, um, we, we, we might believe that God exists. We do believe that God exists. But at, at points in our lives, he seems distant. He seems distant. We think of God. We, 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 I believe in God. But he's out there somewhere. He's out there somewhere. He's, he's in heaven. And where's heaven? Apparently it's in the sky. I don't know. No, but it, it, it's up there. Right? And that's where he is. That's his home. That's where he is. I'm here. He's there. And so we, and it's not that we necessarily think that out real, like, like I just said. We don't necessarily say it out loud. We don't necessarily say it that simply, that straightforwardly in our minds. But that's the feeling that we have. That yeah, I believe in God, but he's out there. And he's not right here. And if we dig a little deeper into our minds, into our hearts, again, this might be us today, it might be us at some point in the past, but I think, again, for most of us, at some point in our lives, we feel that God's distance, and when we dig deeper, why, why do I feel that way? Why, why don't I have an awareness of God literally with me, present to me? Um, and I, I, the reason I think that many of us, if we, we, we looked within and thought about it, maybe prayed about it, would be uh, we have this idea that he's too big or I'm too small or some combination of the both. He's too big, I'm too small, or both for him to be concerned about me. I mean, he's got the whole entire universe to run. It's a big job. How, how can you be worried about my electric bill? Or my final exam? Or my sore foot? Or my ringing cell phone? <laughs> whatever, whatever the problems that we face in our life are, uh, maybe it's the relationships. The big problems, the small problems, um, the ways how God is not with me because these problems they can't possibly concern him he's God I'm just me um, again this is all just by touching on a couple of things in the introduction and uh, this is not my proposal to you this is, this is my statement to you all of those things are lies to think that God is out there and he's too big, or I'm too little for him to be concerned with me. And my problems, big and small, those are lies. Lies that at some point in our lives, someone or something, to be honest, has whispered into my mind and my heart. And what we need to do is firmly categorically, definitively reject those for what they are as lies. He's not just out there. He's not too big. You're not too small. Those are lies that we need to reject and be aware of the truth of the matter that God is here. And, and you know, we, we can just say that. And I say it to you. And we all need to grow in faith, right? But when I say that to you, that's, <laughs> pun intended, God's honest truth. Jesus Christ is in this room. There are, uh, okay, hundreds of angels in this room. Because every one of us has a guardian angel. This room is flooded with God and his angels and his saints. Now, I don't see that. I don't feel that. But that's the truth of the matter. That God is present to us in the course of our ordinary, everyday lives. He is not only here and present to us, but he is concerned with everything we do. Whatever... Uh, uh, and and some, maybe, maybe today's a good day. 
Uh, it's been a great day and there's, there's no worries. It's a carefree day. It, the sun is shining, finally. There's no snow, finally. It's May 3rd, I can't believe it blizzarded the other day. Um, but maybe that's not the case for you. Maybe you have little worries. Maybe you have great worries. God is concerned about all of them. Why? Because, and we hear this all the time, and it, for me at least, it tends, even today, it can go in one ear and out the other, but God loves us each and all. He loves us as these beautiful creatures that he made, but for probably, I'm guessing, the vast majority of us in this room, he loves us even more because when we were baptized, we became sons, daughters of our Heavenly Father. That's not just an image or a metaphor to make us feel good about God. That is the reality of who and what I am. I am, because of my baptism, a son of the almighty, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omni-whatever God. And so are each one of the baptized. The vast majority, I'm sure, all of you, are sons or daughters of our Heavenly Father. And as such, we are brothers and sisters to His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And we are temples of the Holy Spirit. Because of all of that, He desires a relationship with us. A real relationship with us. Um, last night, so part of what I do, uh, Father Paul uh, introduced me. Um, by the way, I'm three months older than Father Paul. And two days, just... Uh, just to be clear about who's greater, really. Um, um, what? Three months and two days. Me? You? Oh, I was talking. Yeah. Um, now I totally see. I threw myself off by pumping myself up. Where was I going with that? I have no idea. Oh yeah, I know, no, I know. So from the Paul's introduction, my role in the diocese, I, I give, I go to our parishes around the diocese, around the east, south, eastern South Dakota, giving presentations like this. But one of the hardest presentations I'm ever asked to do uh, is one actually I had to give last night, um, and and it's a, it's a talk on the spirituality or how to pray when you're grieving the loss of a loved one. And last night, uh, this isn't the first time, but um, uh, it's been a few years since I had to give that talk to a group of people who had lost a loved one to suicide. This is where the rubber meets the road. Is there a God? And what's he up to? Where are you, Lord? So last night I was talking about this, how God desires a real relationship with all of us, even in, especially in, the midst of intense pain. As these six people I was with last night are experiencing. God desires a real relationship with us. He is here and he desires to reveal himself to us in the ordinary everyday parts of our lives. He invites us to recognize him in our midst, to see him. And I'm here to tell you that this can happen because it happens to me. Not in great ways. I've never had visions. I've never heard voices other than my little bread, I mean, my beautiful children. Um, but God reveals himself to me in my daily life. And I'll give you some examples uh, as we go. And he has revealed himself in the daily lives of millions of people across time around the world. And because I've been here several times, I love Watertown, um, I've gotten to know many of you, and I know that God has revealed himself to people who are in this room. Many of you, I'm sure, but there are people in this room who I personally know, and I know that God has revealed himself to you, to them. And what happens when we see him, when we recognize him, he begins to transform us. Not always in the ways that we expect or want. Definitely not always uh, according to our timetable. God works on his schedule, not mine. But I can tell you definitively that when we recognize God in our presence, in our, God's presence in our midst, 
he will transform us. Um, Father Paul Rutten was not, as you may know, born a priest. I was not born a theologian. Uh, the people in this room that I'm thinking of, uh, and all of you, wherever you are at the, your stage in life, that didn't just happen. God has revealed himself to us, to me, to Father, over the course of our lives. And he is slowly but surely transforming us. And he desires to do, to do the same thing for all of us. So I'm not over-promising. This is real. This happens. And I'm going to give you some concrete examples of what I'm talking about. So, where do we see God in our daily lives? How do we see him? That's what we're going to look at. So what I want to do, um, I think you should all have the uh, handout, if you don't, the little flyer. Um, on the, the inside, on the left side, you'll just find a really basic outline. Um, if you don't have one of these, could you just raise your hand? Okay, uh, there any, there's a couple in the back. Who don't? Who was passing them out? I saw somebody passing them out earlier. It's a race. Who's going to get there? Missy? And they're getting closer. Who's going to win? I, <laughs> and it's my nose. The Kentucky Derby is coming up, is it? Oh, and over by the doors. Somebody over here, raise your hand. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. No. So the first point, the first point substantially that I want to mention, after the resurrection, Jesus' own disciples didn't recognize him. Okay? The fact that you and I can struggle to see God in our daily lives is not unique. It's been a problem for almost 2,000 years. Going back, we're in the midst of the Easter season, of course, and when you read the Gospel accounts, um, of Jesus' appearances after his resurrection to his disciples, almost always, they don't recognize him. For some reason, they're kept from recognizing him. And what I want to do is just look at a couple examples, and then later we're going to come back to them, but a couple of examples of how these are men and women who spent years with Jesus, even, including his closest apostles. And, and in many cases... They didn't recognize him for some reason. Uh, and we're going to talk about why that might be in a little bit. But the first example I want to give comes um, from Luke's Gospel. It actually uh, was the reading from this last Sunday's Mass, uh, the Gospel reading, where there are two disciples. Um, this is the, the day of the resurrection, that first Sunday, when Jesus rose from the dead. It's evening, and these two disciples are leaving Jerusalem. They're going the wrong way. Jerusalem is the heart of the, the, of, of the, uh, the faith for the people of Israel. It's where the temple is. It's where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper. It's where he died. And they're leaving Jerusalem. Uh, they're going to a nearby village called Emmaus. And as they're walking, somebody comes up and walks alongside them, and it's Jesus. But for some reason, they're kept from recognizing him. So I just wanna, I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing. Uh, but I just want to pick up with part of the story. So what Jesus does, they, they start a conversation, and then Jesus um, starts ex unpacking the Bible for them, explaining how everything is ultimately leading to him. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Again, they, st they don't know it's Jesus. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they, then they told what had happened on the road, 
and how he was known to them in the, making, in the breaking of the bread. So this story, and we go, there's some details in here I'm going to unpack in a little bit. But Jesus comes alongside, he opens the scriptures, he's going to go on, they ask him to stay, and then he's made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Two disciples of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, not just people in the crowds, disciples of Jesus who, who did not recognize him until the breaking of the bread. The second example I want to give uh, comes also from that first Easter Sunday. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene goes in the, to the tomb in the morning and she's weeping because the stone's been rolled away and Jesus' body is gone. It's not there. And she's crying uh, and then she starts a conversation with somebody who she thinks is the gardener, but it's Jesus. Uh, and, and, and this is a bit of, of that story. Saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet yet ascended to the Father. So this is the woman who went with Jesus to the end. She was at the foot of the cross with John John the Apostle, with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she thinks he's the gardener until he says her name. And I'll, again, I'll come back to that. The last example is um, also from John's Gospel. Seven of Jesus' disciples, after Easter, they've seen Jesus. They go back home. They go back to their jobs. What was their job? Fishermen. They, they made their living as fishermen. They were skilled fishermen. They go out one night. Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. So they go out at night, which is when normally they would go fishing. Um, and they catch nothing. And this is what happens in the morning. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, have you, have you any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in for the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his clothes, for he was stripped for work, and sprang into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And it goes on from there. But again, these are the closest of Jesus' disciples. Peter and John in particular. Peter, who becomes the first pope. John's the beloved disciple. And they do not initially recognize Jesus. All these examples, we see um, people who are close to Jesus during his life on earth did not recognize him. So this gets to the second part of the outline. For us as Jesus' disciples, he often hides himself in the midst of our lives. Whether it's the year 33 A.D. or 2017 A.D., Jesus is present to us, but he hides. He is present in our midst, but we don't see him. What I want to do, what I would like to invite you to do, um, is we're just going to take a a couple minutes, two or three minutes, uh, with those around you, maybe somebody at your table, or if you're at a table by yourself, maybe the table nearby, Why does Jesus hide from us? Why does he play Where's Waldo? (laughs) Just have a little discussion for a couple minutes. Why does Jesus make it hard for us to recognize his presence in our lives? Two or three minutes, go.
One more minute. from us. If he's really here, as I'm proposing, as we propose, as many of you have experienced, uh, perhaps most of you throughout your lives, why does Jesus hide from us? Yes? He's brilliant. Oh. He wants us to seek him. Because he wants us to seek him. He wants us to find him. realize that he's there. Who else? Paul. He wants us to have that free will choice of seeing him or not. He wants us to choose to look for him or not. Okay? Yes. He doesn't want to be taken for granted. If we saw him easily, maybe we'd take him for granted. We're self-centered, therefore... Well, we're thinking of ourselves and tomorrow and yesterday and, and we don't... We aren't also looking at seeing Jesus and everybody around us. Yeah, so... You're right. So he hides sort of in others, so we have to come out of ourselves to look around. And at so he looks like a gardener. Are we going to think that? Right. So in an ordinary way of, of a gardener. Right. One more. Yes. He wants us to open the... Boy, you guys are... Did somebody copy my notes? <laughs> so the one I want to stick with actually was the first one. So those are all great. And, there, and there, there's a lot we, you could, we could explore and unpack. I, I wanted to stick with the first one actually that was offered. He wants us to look for him. He wants us to seek him. He wants us to... He's, he's standing at the door knocking. And he wants us to open the door. Yeah, high five. Back. <laughs> he wants us 
to look for him. So how do we look for him? How do we seek him? How do we search for him? How do we see him? We have to look at things, at everything, differently. Recognizing Jesus in our ordinary, everyday lives isn't like a game of where, where's Waldo. It's seeing differently. And this is what, I have a prop, I am so excited. If you guys don't love this prop, I'm going to be crushed. <laughs> this came to me last week as I was thinking about this talk. Well, I'm gonna be, before we get to discussing this image, can you see this in the back, Father? Is that, that a confident yes? <laughs> can you or not? I'm coming. So, how many of you have seen this picture before I showed it to you? Many of you. Okay, so many of you know where. Um, for those of you who have not seen this picture before, how many of, so just those of you who have never saw it before right now, how many of you see an old woman? Now, the others of you are like, what are you talking about? How many of you see a young woman? <laughs> now, talk to the people next to you. So, right, so the, the old woman, eye, eyelash, nose, mouth. Oh, yeah. Young woman, she's got her, her, she's turning away. Here's her eyelash, her ear, her hair, her chin. Oh, yeah. I love this prop. What, why do I love it? Why do I love this? Because this is what it's like looking for Jesus. He's there. We just have to see it. There, I could have had one of those 3D things where you're, but that's too hard. Okay, okay, okay. We, we know there's a young woman and an old woman. Google the image. Take a picture after we're done. We're talking about Jesus again now, not the women. I lost you guys right there. Lost, gone. Recognizing Jesus in the ordinary every day is like seeing both of the women in this picture. It's not about where's Waldo. He's not hiding under the table. He's here. We have to have not a new vision. We have to have new vision to see him. I'm going to turn it around so you can't look at it anymore. <laughs> We have to have new vision to see him. Again, the third point on the outline, we need to look at things, everything, differently. We have to look at everything differently. We were, at our baptism, given new vision. We were given, we weren't given technically, it, we got LASIK surgery at baptism. Our vision was corrected. But now I'm really going to mix metaphors. But it's like, if, for those of you who wear glasses know, the first time you put on glasses, it's, you have to get used to, or a new prescription. You have to get used to seeing things with the new prescription. That's true of the new vision that we received at our baptism. The new vision that allows us to recognize God in our everyday lives, in the ordinary events of our lives. We need to accustom ourselves to our new vision. And we're going to get into, in the, um, uh, the next point, the last point of the outline, we're going to talk about how we do that. But the fourth point, we have been given new vision. We just need to accustom ourselves to do it, to, to, to it, to our new vision. How do we do that? How do we fundamentally accustom ourselves to our new vision? That's why I want to give you one more story from the Gospels. This is a story of a man who, I don't know, the last 20, 30 years, uh, we've come to call him Blind Bart. Blind Bart. We call him Blind Bart. He's a blind man. Uh, and this story is told in several of the Gospels. His name is Bartimaeus, uh, which Bar, son of... Timaeus, Timothy. So he's the son of Timothy. His name's Bartimaeus. But it's just more clever to say blind Bart than b blind Bartimaeus. So blind Bart uh, has a powerful story that we read about. I'm just going to give you Mark's account. Jesus came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. 
And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Many rebuked him, telling him to shut up. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, rise, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. So I just stop stop right there. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. What is he? He's blind. Father Paul called me right now and I shut my eyes. It would be ugly real fast. (laughs) Jesus said, call him. They say, take heart, rise, he is calling you. He doesn't care. He throws off his cloak, his one possession. He throws aside and he wanders to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Jesus says to me and to you, What do you want me to do for you? Now, he's a blind man. It's, it's almost a silly question. Like, there's, 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 there's depth to it. But he's blind. What do you think, Jesus? Why does he say that to, Bl- to Bart? Because he wants him to ask for it. What do you want me to do? And the blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Jesus this whole idea, we have new vision, how do we become accustomed to it? Ask him. The whole thing about, he wants us to look for him. He wants us to ask him. One of the things um, that, that I'm just going to talk about now, I was going to talk about later, how do we get this vision so on? Uh, prayer. Spending time with Jesus. But I think for a lot of us, um, I'm guessing the vast majority of us are Catholic, but whether you're Catholic or, or another Christian, for us as Catholics especially, when we learned how to pray, we learned prayers. Which is absolutely important and essential. But learning prayers isn't necessarily the same thing as learning how to pray. You can say prayers. Saying prayers is different than praying prayers. And sometimes you can pray without prayers. Sometimes we just need to say what's on our heart. Master, I want to see. And sometimes it's the... the, Lord, how am I going to pay the electric bill this month? Again, I think that we have this idea that, that God's only interested in our big problems. Maybe our relationships or our our faith or whatever. God's interested in everything. The sore foot. The electric bill. The test. And of course also the big things. The marriage. The relationship with children. Friends, co-workers. The difficult boss. Whatever it is, when we pray... He says to us, what do you want me to do for you? It's Jesus calling. No problem, Dave. So be, be honest in your prayer. Show him, tell him what he wants. So what I want to do, just to wrap up, uh, running out of time, I want time, 
Hopefully you're not running me out of town. Um, <laughs> I want to return this fifth point on the outline to the examples of the, the apostles, the disciples that we began with, and what they tell, what they mean for you and I today. Jesus reveals himself to us today the same way he revealed himself to his own disciples. So again, Mary Magdalene, when did she recognize Jesus? When he called her name. Jesus calls our name all... He, call, he calls me all the time. Chris. I don't always hear him. Why, 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 why might I not always hear him? I'll give you a big reason today why not only me, but other people I've talked to don't always hear him. I distract myself. I'm not paying attention. I fill my life with noise because I'm afraid of the silence. I've gotten in the habit lately of uh, my, my, my commute to work in Sioux Falls is only 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but I almost always leave the radio off. Deliberately. Because I want to have the time of silence. Because it's very calm driving through Sioux Falls, you know. <laughs> but, but, but spending, how, how do I hear his voice? By spending time with him. By learning the sound of his voice in prayer. Maybe just, um, actually I just had this conversation today with a good friend um, who's dealing with a lot right now. Uh, and, and I encouraged her, before you go to bed, if you haven't prayed, just say, When Our Father. I think we have, at least I have this idea that's either go big or go home, right? No, that's, for me at least that does not work. I usually go home. But for me, when it comes to my spiritual life, including my prayer life, it's baby steps. So spending a little bit of time every day so I start to become familiar with his voice. So I can hear him call my name. Um, the, the, The disciples... They return to their jobs as fishermen. And Jesus reveals himself to them in the midst of their work. They're doing their job, literally. Just do your job, Bill Belichick, right? They're doing their job. And Jesus reveals himself to them. Jesus doesn't just show up in our personal prayer time, whether it's whenever it is during the day, or at Sunday Mass, or daily Mass, or whatever it is. Jesus is everywhere, including where we work. Whether that's in the home, or in the field, or in the office, or wherever it is. Jesus is present there. And just as he revealed himself to the disciples there, he reveals himself to you and I there. That's through the circumstances of our, of, of our, of our lives, our job, our, our work, our family, our schools, uh, where we shop. Jesus is present there in the circumstances and in, this came up, this was brought up earlier, in the people around me. Mother Teresa, we, 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 we know, Saint Teresa of Calcutta saw Jesus in the eyes, uh, in the poor. She saw Jesus, and that wasn't just a metaphor. She was really aware of Christ's presence in the poorest of the poor in Calcutta. She saw him, and she sought him out and sought to serve him. Loving her brothers, her neighbor, her brother, her sister, and loving Jesus present in them. Many times Jesus reveals himself to us through other people. That's one of the most common ways that he did this. Um, last week, so I told you, I, I was struck with my brilliant idea. Actually, it was, it was God's idea with this. But uh, uh, so I'll be honest, I was, uh, last week I was pre- thinking about this talk. And I called Missy and I said, Missy, what do you want me to talk about? And she said, I think you should pray about it, Chris. <laughs> okay. That's true. I, I agree. 
But in, I, as I go to prayer, I think it'd be helpful for you know just give me give me where are the where are the fence posts like just point me in a general direction. I, I don't need you know an exact compass heading, but just like north, west, east, south. I, I, I'll I'll do that for you after you pray. That was Jesus speaking to me. I wanted a shortcut. Just tell me what to say. And he spoke through her to go to him. Um, Good Friday, 2006. Uh, we, my wife and I had, well, <laughs> she just had um, twins in February. So we had twins who were like two months old at this time, and they were hard babies. I loved them to death, but they were both hard babies. And we had a 19-month-old at the same time. So, um, you know this exercise? The, 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 baby, the, the, the boy and a girl, Carl and Noel, would not sleep unless I was bouncing them on an exercise ball. So I spent hours. I popped three of them. But I spent hours bouncing on this stupid exercise. Anyway, I'm not bitter. Um, Good Friday, 2006. They're a couple months old. Uh, didn't get a good Friday service, was reading the readings or whatever. And I was starting to get anxious because I had a plan for my life, especially for my professional life and where I was going to go and so on. And I was getting anxious because deadlines in my, my plan were coming up and I didn't know what was next. And in the midst of that circumstance, which was beginning to be filled with anxiety, God uh, knocked on the door and said, what are you worrying about? This isn't my plan. This is yours. He revealed himself. And it, was, it wasn't a voice. When I say that, it was just an awareness I had that I was nervous, anxious, and fretting because I was not being attentive to God's will, but to my own. So in that circumstance, he spoke clearly to, into me. I'm re reminded there, by the way, of Mary and Martha in the Gospels. You know, poor Martha, she's, she's doing the cooking, right? She's flipping the burgers, she's grilling the hot dogs, and Mary's sitting there like at the feet of Jesus, and Martha's like, what the heck are you doing? Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious about many things. One thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the better half. The problem was not that Martha was being attentive to her guest. The problem was that Martha wasn't paying attention to her guest. Martha could have been doing what she was doing and been attentive to Jesus, but she was focused on what she was doing. In the midst of our lives, our work circumstances, our home circumstances, whatever it is, are we pay, paying attention to Jesus or to what we're doing? He's revealing himself to us in our midst. Uh, a couple last examples and then we'll wrap up and I'll take a couple questions. The road to Emmaus. Right, so what I love about the road to Emmaus, there are a couple things. First of all, um, again, they, 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 they get close to Emmaus and Jesus acts like he's going to go on. Why? Again, because he wants them to ask him to stay. He wants them to invite him in. He wants you and I to invite him in. And then we read in that story about how their hearts were burning within them as he read, as he opened the scriptures to them on their way. We're all familiar with the Bible. The joke, of course, is that Catholics don't know our Bibles very well. And maybe that's true. I don't really I think sometimes that's used as a crutch. Well, that's just a Catholic. We, we don't know the Bible very well. But we can. It doesn't mean you have to read it cover to cover. I, I, frankly, I usually encourage people to start with the Gospels. You can learn the rest. It's, it's, on, it's on the bucket list, right? I mean, there's no r r rush. Um, but God speaks to us through the Scriptures. And many of you have heard me, I, I, I've, I've shared this example more than once, uh, even including in Watertown. So some of you have heard this before, but this is still the clearest example in my life 
of how God spoke to me through Scripture. So this is the fall of 2011. And um, Jermaine, my wife, is now pregnant with our fifth. So we even had more after the twins. Um, So we're expecting the twins. We have the 20-week ultrasound. uh, And we find out that uh, she's a girl. And so we gave her the name Mercedes. Uh, but, But Mercy... Uh, had a kidney that wasn't working, wasn't developing properly. Um, the other one was fine, but, but, and I don't remember which side, but one of them was not developing properly. And as you all remember from your biology, you only need one kidney, but you need one kidney. So me, um, as I often joke, God bless my parents, but thanks to them I'm genetically predisposed to worry. And so just starting like, okay, what's going to happen here? I'm, I'm a control freak, so when I don't know what's going to happen, I, that really bugs me and I get anxious. Um, my, part of my prayer, uh, the way that I pray, is I, I, I pray with the daily Mass readings. And the daily Mass reading, that day, October 4th, 2011, the first reading at Mass was from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Which, and the reading was this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I, uh, much to my own surprise, was not worried about my daughter. I didn't know what was going to happen. I prayed for, we prayed for the health of her other kidney. Um, And praise be to God, that kidney developed fine and she's now a spunky five-year-old. But but that passage was for me that day. That was God speaking to me that day. I have no doubt and there are other instances, that's, 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 that's more powerful for me, but many other instances where when I've read a passage, I know that that is Jesus revealing himself to me. And I am nothing unique and nothing special that way. That's God's will for every one of us. All of these things, it's God's desire that, that he reveal himself to us in this way. The last example, uh, also from the road to Emmaus, when was Jesus revealed to them? In the breaking of the bread. And he vanished from their sight. He broke the bread, the bread. Their eyes were opened, we read. They recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Because he had, he had become... This is just an unconsecrated host. I didn't steal it. Father gave it to me. Um, bread. Ordinary bread. Unleavened bread. Becomes... And I think... Especially for the... I'm a cradle Catholic. Uh, For me, being a lifelong Catholic, I take the gift and the wonder and the awe of this all too often for granted. But talk about Jesus revealing himself to us in an ordinary way. Jesus literally becomes present to us, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the living God, in a small piece of bread. Jesus, at the beginning of John's Gospel, when the first disciples approach Jesus and begin to follow him, he turns around and says to them, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? And the disciples said, where are you staying? Which makes no sense whatsoever. But they, were, they weren't the best and the brightest and the holiest. Which is a uh, consolation for us. Where are you staying? And he says to them, come and see. Come and see. He makes the same invitation to you and I today. 
He is present in our midst and says to us, calls us by name, what do you want me to do for you? What are you looking for? Come and see. And when we do that, when we're honest with him and we just bear our heart to him and we tell him what we're looking for, what we're worried about, tell him what we want, and he invites us to come and see and we respond and we follow him upon the way, he begins to transform and change our lives. I, was, I said as a cradle Catholic, I went to the University of Minnesota. I was an engineering major. And while God had gifted me uh, academically or intellectually, however you want to describe it, I squandered those gifts. Um, and my sophomore year, I failed two college classes. That's the first time I'd gotten, ever gotten a, an F in anything. First time I got less than an A in, since like elementary school. I squandered God's gifts. And, but he allowed me, as he often does, he allowed me to wander away. And then he called me back. And I didn't hear voices. I said that earlier. Uh, for me, it was two evangelical Protestants who asked me, do you want to get involved in a Bible study? Um, and, and I agreed. But as a stubborn German, I wanted to know more about my Catholic faith before I left it. Uh, and that led me down the path to where I am today, having worked for the diocese for 17 years, growing in my faith, sharing it with other people, and helping them learn how to share it with others themselves. Jesus Christ has transformed my life. He has transformed the lives, again, of countless millions of people throughout the years. He has transformed the lives of people in this room, obviously including your pastor. This is real. His invitation is real. Come and see. We simply have to say to him, Lord, I want to see. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. So, we, I'm going to take a couple minutes for questions, but then what we're going to do afterwards, as you, you probably know if you've gone to previous, uh, come to previous uh, episodes of the Faith in Real Life series, afterwards we're invited to go, in, you are invited to go into the chapel and, and spend some time in adoration. I want to encourage you though, even if, if you don't have the time uh, to do that, just make a brief visit in the church. Spend, if, if, you, if you have to go or if you don't have enough time where you'd like to stay longer, just make a brief visit. The invitation I said earlier to, that I made to a friend today, just saying, Our Father, and even what I said tonight, just speak whatever is on your heart. I would invite you, if you can't stay for some adoration, to make that simple little short 20, 30 second prayer from the heart. Okay? So, that'll, that's good to happen. But any questions anybody has before we dismiss for prayer or whatever? Not all at once. <laughs> yes? Right. So with, with, with loved ones, whether it be spouse or children also too, um, if you've ever had the experience where you've been set afire and the other friend or family member hasn't been, it can be a real struggle of, what do I do? Like, I don't want to put, as you said, I don't want to push. That does not work. Try that. And my wife, I mean, she's, she's, she's well on the way as well. Uh, but, but not push, love and walk with. So again, that road to Emmaus, the image, Jesus came along and said, they, they were going, and you did say this about your wife, but they were going the wrong way. And Jesus walked alongside them. And if you, I didn't read the beginning of the story, but Jesus, they're going the wrong way, but Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He walks with them and engages them in conversation, in relationship. So my general advice when somebody's wondering, what do I do when somebody who I care about isn't there yet? Uh, child, spouse, parents, walk with them. Pray for them, love them, and be ready 
for that day when the door opens to gently don't like okay <laughs> gently share what's on your mind and your heart. For, for them? No. No, there is no sense. No, that's a good question. Can I pray too hard? No. Now, if it's out loud to them, yes. <laughs> Lord Jesus, please just bring her to you. I don't, I don't know. I know you didn't mean that. He didn't mean that. Yeah, no. No, 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 because the Holy Spirit is much more gentle than you and I. So let him do his thing, but you, you keep begging him to do his thing. Thank you. The great question. Anybody else? So the ice has been broken now. So the... Yes. When I pray, I give it to the Blessed Mother and the Lord, Lord. And then about 10 minutes later, I take it back and start all over again. I can't leave it up there and forget about it. I just... What you're praying for, you mean? Yeah. So the, the difficulty sometimes of, you know, we, we, when there's something that's bothering us, we want to give it, I, Lord, I'm going to give this to you, you take care of it. And then about 10 minutes later, I'm just going to take this little part and I'll take care of this. because what, what, What's that saying? Because I don't trust that you're going to. So that's totally me too. Pray for trust. Pray for faith. Lord, I'm going to give this to you. I know I'm going to want to take it back in two seconds. Deepen my faith and my trust in you. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. <laughs> Somebody always comes to Martha's defense. <laughs> I know, I know, I've been told this a hundred times, but but you know, I always think, yeah, it would be wonderful to set up clean feet. But who's going to be in the kitchen? To be in the kitchen? Right. So that's why. No, 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 hold on, hold on. That's why. This was Martha's problem. I wish I could open. I wish this was open. But I'm going to have to go in, in here through the... Martha was... Martha should have been doing the dishes and, and watching Jesus. But she was in here doing her own thing, not paying attention. Did you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Because if I were in there and you couldn't hear me, that would have been really awkward. <laughs> so it's not that she was serving. It's not that she was serving. It's that she wasn't being attentive to him in the midst of her serving. But it's hard to make in one room and... <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> but for you and I, the, the good thing is he's in both places. <laughs> and in Martha's case, it, they, they, it was a one-room house. So she didn't have that excuse. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, you realize that it was in the process in the shape and form of someone else, or it said that their vision was masked because of their anxiety? Yeah, so, so all these instances of the, the disciples not being able to recognize Jesus, what was, what was actually, what was going on there? Did, did he literally look differently? Or is it with them? I think it was with them. Like, for whatever reason, you know, sometimes when you and I are busy, literally we don't see something that happens right in front of us. I think God was orchestrating that so they weren't stopping and looking and seeing that it was Him. Because that's what He wanted to happen. So He allowed them to, to be busy and not to stop and look at Him. I, I think He looked like Himself, um, but they weren't able to see it. Yeah, yeah, their lack of, especially the, 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 the ones on the road to Emmaus, their lack of faith, um, because they just went through, and so I said earlier, uh, accompaniment, walking with people, Jesus uh, was very gentle with them at first. 
But then he starts to ask them, what are you talking about? Engages them further in conversation. And they basically say, we thought Jesus was the Messiah, but that he was killed. And, we, and no, some women said he was rushed, but we don't know what's going on. And then he challenges them. He rebukes them for their hardness of heart. So sometimes we don't recognize Jesus because of the hardness of our heart. But I'm here to tell you my own experience when I was 20 years old at the University of Minnesota, God can break through that like nothing. So if you have somebody who was me, pray for them. Pray for them. And in his time, again, I said that earlier, the transformation happens on his schedule, not ours. That can be really frustrating, but that's where we're called to trust him. Pray for them, and when, when the time is right, it'll happen. One more question. Do you think it was an accident that you're sitting right behind the Last Supper? Uh, so, is it an accident that I'm standing right in front of the last supper? There are no accidents and there are no coincidences with God. This was on purpose. I didn't orchestrate it. Normally, I'm like over there. Amen? Amen. Have a great night. Thank you.